Okay, I'm going to start any second now. Right, okay. Uh, good morning, everyone, and welcome to uh, this uh, webinar on the future of smart home energy uh, hosted by uh, Device Pilot. Um, we will be looking, as the title suggests, we're looking at um, the, the key technologies uh, that you know will make homes smarter in future, what that involves, what the, uh, the key barriers are and the, the, the key measures we can, can take to, um, to, to roll them out. Uh, so I will introduce the panelists and then we will, we will dive straight in. So we have on the line um, Fjellgren Beert, uh, CEO and co-founder of Device Pilot, um, world's leading IoT service management platform, I'd say that, it's their webinar, um, which works with companies including Podpoint, an EV charging provider and the Dutch utility Eneco. Um, Fjellgren has more than 30 years experience uh, in the tech industry. Um, uh, including uh, working three Silicon Valley startups uh, and uh, then coming back to the UK and becoming a serial entrepreneur. Uh, we also have uh, Jacob Briggs, a senior consulting analyst at Cornwall Insight, um, where his area of expertise is the domestic retail market. Uh, and before uh, moving to Cornwall, he founded the Norwich Food Hub. Um, which he still runs today. Uh, we also have Dr. Sarah Darby, the Associate Professor and Acting Leader of the Energy Programme at the Environmental Change Institute at Oxford University, uh, where she works on the introduction of smart devices to electricity systems uh, and the potential for demand-side response uh, uh, in systems integrating um, renewable energy into, uh, into supplies and how that affects patterns of demand. Uh, Neil Stewart is the CEO of Glen Dimplex. Um, uh, a company he's worked at for, for uh, more than 20 years uh, and has obviously uh, overseen a huge period of change uh, during that time. Ben Cott is CEO of Light Source Labs uh, at BP Light Source uh, and also a member of the BBC's Sustainability Advisory Panel. Uh, and before that, um, uh, he was the clean energy principal at, at Google and founded Fabric, an IoT platform for energy resource and smart building data. Uh, and finally, uh, Phil Steele is a future technologies evangelist at Octopus Energy, a role he moved into after Octopus bought his previous company, NCube, a smart home platform. So, uh, Having done those introductions, I'll dive straight into the questions. Um, I'll start with you, Pilgrim. Um, what do you see as the key technologies in the future of, of home energy? Well, thank, thanks, Mike. That's a very broad question. I suppose uh, in the context of the UK, I think homes are really important, especially during COVID. I mean, about 30% of all um, UK energy is used in homes, not just electricity, but but all energy. Um, about something like 65% of that is gas, may, used mainly for heating. Um, we know gas boilers are going to be banned in new build from, I think, 2025. Um, I, I think electrification is going to make homes even more important to the UK because we're going to see the arrival of new forms of production, PV, consumption, EV, and possibly storage um, in the shape of batteries and, and heat stores. Um, I, I'm interested in technologies that are sort of good for individuals, good for society and good for climate change, not just because all those things are nice, warm, fuzzy things, uh, but, but because when all those forces are aligned, then stuff really happens quickly. Um, and I think just thinking about technology in general, there are two types of technology, really. I think there's the, the heavy lifting laws of physics technology, things like insulation, which, by the way, we really need to do a lot more of, um, batteries, heat stores, and that kind of thing. And then there's technology to add intelligence. Um, and that could be things like increasing efficiency. You know, don't heat your home when you're not in it, if you can remember what that was like before COVID, <laughs> um, or increasing the sort of sociability. So things like demand response and so on. 
Um, I think technologies have a couple of interesting properties. They have learning curves. So as they hit price parity, then they can get adopted very quickly. But they also have stepping stones. So often it's hard to do one technology until you've done some precursor technology. Um, and so I think, you know, if we're talking about a sort of five year summer, summary, uh, five year horizon um, uh, today, then I think heating technologies have got to be really high up on, on the list. Uh, embedded intelligence within devices for various reasons, but also connected intelligence. Um, so connecting devices to the internet for, for various reasons. Um, and I think particularly in that regard, smart meters are interesting. We're now more than 10 years into our smart meter, smart meter rollout in the UK. Um, we've now got about 10 million smart meters live and it feels like they're about to hit their stride. Right, okay. Uh, and what will that mean when, when they do hit their stride? What will uh, that enable that, you know, that we don't have at the moment? I've got some thoughts, but I'd be interested in other people's thoughts as well about that. Yeah. Um, uh, uh, does anyone else want to, to dive in on that? And um, and also, uh, did Pilgrim miss any any vital technologies that we need to need well, to be looking at? Yeah, Mike, I can I can join in and answer from a kind of an octopus point of view with uh, with smart meters. So there's something like 10 million meters now on the DCC. Uh, so that's the government's um, central system, SMETS 2, as we call them, although some of the SMETS 1 meters have now got enrolled on DCC as well. Um, and of course, what that allows us to do is really interesting tariffs like our Agile tariff and our Go and Go Faster sets of tariffs, um, the Tesla tariff that we've got and things like this. Um, and what we're seeing is that that is engaging customers in um, how energy is being generated and the time of day that they're consuming it and how green that energy is. So if you take the peak period of 4 to 7 p.m. Um, in the evening, that's typically when there's high demand on the grid and therefore more than 50 percent of our electricity is coming from um, gas uh, uh, generators. Um, whereas the rest of the day, there's probably a higher level of wind, like the wind generator behind me. Um, yeah or from uh, solar generation when we get back up to, to, to sunny days and things. And, and those time use tariffs are starting to engage consumers in understanding that, that, that sort of thing. And, and that's only possible um, at the moment through, through smart meters and through that infrastructure. Uh, Dr. Darby, I'm going to come to you next um, uh, and ask you what you see as the most significant technology uh, in the home energy market over the next five years. Um, what sort of penetration might we get uh, of that technology? What are the key barriers to it? And um, does it then cause sort of knock on second order issues that we need to, to address as well? I suppose if I were just picking out one technology, it would still have to be the smart meter because that's the precursor that helps make sense of, of all the others. Yeah. Um, and um, it, it, the rollout has been quite a lot slower than was anticipated, but I think, um, it, and, and indeed there are plenty of people out there who will criticize aspects of it, and there are plenty that you could criticize, but I'd say it's worked as well as it has, um, partly because there's been a good deal of attention paid to what, um, the interface between the people who use the smart meters and the smart meters themselves. So whenever I get the chance, I bang on about how our smart meter rollout actually has three elements to it. It's putting the meter in, it's the customer interface that everyone can have who wants it, the in-home display, which is actually what most, you know, a majority of customers really think about when they think about the smart meter. Yeah. And there's also the trained installer because the code of practice requires all the installers to have basic communication skills training and to be able to give basic energy efficiency advice. And um, certainly it's shown that the customers who had a good experience at installation and have some kind of relationship with the smart meter and understand how their display works, they're the people who say they're getting the most benefit from it. Um, right. So it's, it's not just about rolling out the technology, it's rolling out the the knowledge and giving people a good experience at installation that's making the difference there. Yeah and Pilgrim said we're yeah, it feels like we're at a, a tipping point and the smart meter program has uh, come in for uh, you know a certain amount of criticism over the years. Do you, do you think that we're, 
we're over any teething problems and the the uh, the expansion of the program. It's not just going to be about those sheer numbers, but about what we've already learned um, from you know what we've done that that will you know yeah. will that uh, sort of give us added benefits that that, that um, will we, we'll, we'll help the whole program to, to work better. Um, that does seem to be the case, yes. And and it's also been a part of the program that there's been an evaluation done on it, you know, year on year on a scale that is very unusual, I think, worldwide. Um, and if indeed, if you if you just look at the the raw the basic figures for um, the savings made, the customer savings, which were part of the original business plan, um, in the first year or two, um, these were. I think it was about 2% for electricity, 1.5 for gas over uh, compared with the, the legacy meter customers. And that has risen over time. So it does show that there is a, a whole process of learning taking place. So now the best, uh, the, the most effective rollouts that are going on where the most care is being taken, we're looking at figures between three and four percent savings now. So right. there does seem to be this overall learning that's taking place. Yeah, okay. Um, uh, I'll move on to, to Neil now. Um, so you've been um, working in a sector that uh, uh, has traditionally not been connected at all. You've sold individual devices, and uh, 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 and that was that, I guess. How how um, how's connectivity changed? What what you do and what you sell, and, and how will will that evolve over the next five years? Yeah, thanks, Mike. I think we, we talk about the three Ds, which is digitization, decarbonization, and decentralization. And I think we've seen our industry move dramatically uh, within the last three to four years, but it's been a journey that probably started 10 to 15 years ago. Certainly from an electrical device point of view, where we're looking at, as you said earlier, replacing fossil fuel boilers with electrically driven devices, such as heat pumps and energy stores and other thermal devices, uh, that digitization has already happened. And every product that is sold today in the market has that electronic control capability, which is vitally important. I think Sarah's point is very interesting about the impact of smart meters. Up until now, a lot of it, the benefit from smart meters has been driven by consumer behavior, where people are given information through their in-home displays and take a, a proactive decision to switch devices on and off. I, my personal view is the real benefit has not yet happened, and that is when devices automatically switch on and off in response to signals from the energy system. And that is when you will get substantial uh, improvements in the decarbonization of the grid, but also in the energy efficiency and the cost, the running cost for consumers. Optimization of charging of electric vehicles is obvious. But actually, the same logic applies to heating, uh, particularly hot water, which can be stored in a vessel, but also space heating, uh, which can be stored in a, you know, a, a thermal storage type heating device, or where we phase the heating through the day at appropriate times to, to buffer the system. So I think that my summary point would be the smart meter enables an automated response, and companies like mine are investing heavily in having that onboard intelligence to make sure the appliances continue to provide the utility that the customer wants without the customer having to really do anything other than set the temperature in time. And these benefits that you talk about, um, are they here already in terms of the, the overall network effect? I mean, clearly you say the technology is there, but it, are the, the devices that are in homes already enough to make a significant difference, or do we need that further rollout to... Um, I think the, the devices that. need to be upgraded and made smart, for sure, and that will happen progressively over time. I mean, a typical life of a heating system could be 15 or 20 years, 
So it's not, it's unrealistic to expect people to replace a relatively new system. But I think if you take you know 27 million homes in the UK and a 20 year life, then you're going to have to replace 1.3 to 1.5 million heating systems per year just through the normal upgrading of old systems. Yeah. And we need to make sure that as many of those as possible are smart uh, into the future. And that I think the industry is ready to do that. A missing link is probably joining up the energy market with the delivery of utility through these devices. So flexible tariffs are talked about a lot. Um, I'd be interested in the views from Octopus on this, but uh, you know, I, I think in terms of the consumer actually being able to take advantage of a time of use tariff or a you know a flexible daily tariff, there's very little evidence of that actually being deployed in the market yet. That will be a key enabler to unlock the value for the consumer. So, Phil, do you think that? Um, what's that about then? Is is that to do with consumer resistance or unfamiliarity, or do we need some kind of uh, government intervention to uh, to either make it easier for customers to do that? Or, yeah, don't, or to sort of let's, let's a, try not to get the government to try and intervene. We've got enough government regulation <laughs> in the energy industry, right. so we leave them alone. Okay. <laughs> I think um, as the the um, Look at, look at the way Octopus is. We're incredibly entrepreneurial and experimenting with a lot of different technologies and things that we're doing with tariffs. So let me explain a bit about the Agile tariff because that's, I think, what Neil was touching on there. Um, we haven't really released the numbers, but there's tens of thousands of customers on our smart tariffs. So Agile import, Agile export, Go, Go Faster, Tesla, um, and, and so on. And there's probably a lot more that we'll do over the next few um, weeks, months, years as well. If you look on Twitter and in the Facebook groups, you'll often see customers are sharing screenshots of their agile statements showing the average pence per kilowatt hour that they're achieving um, often below even 10 or 12 pence per kilowatt hour compared to a flat rate tariff of about 15 16 pence um, back in well you know more recently over the past couple of months or so the wholesale market has been pretty um, pretty high which has had a knock-on effect on the agile tariff and we've seen it quite often we're hitting the 35 pence peak um, price that we cap at between four and seven some customers have moved um, naturally onto the, the Go tariff instead, but a lot of customers have stayed with it. And if they've got um, EV chargers or they've got um, home battery storage systems or they're using um, smart hot water systems, then they're still able to use the off-peak energy um, overnight and through mid-morning. Now, this time of day actually is a good time as well. And they're still getting their average price down below a normal flat rate tariff, even with that 35 pence peak between um, 4 and 7 p.m. So it is, it is working and the customers are super engaged, but it, it's a small number of customers. And I think part of that reason perhaps is that, that kind of element of fear, perhaps that you see those kind of 35p periods and wonder, can I get, can I avoid that? And um, what technology do I need? And um, yeah. because it's a tariff that's calculated every day, published at 4 p.m. from the wholesale market, there's this kind of, what's it going to be like tomorrow? Now the general pattern is the same as a peak in the first thing in the morning between eight and eight and 10 or so drops down, goes quite low around about half past three, and it'll spike then at four till seven. So you can still follow the general pattern. But because we've published an API, uh, and that's been there for at least two years on the, the Agile Tariff, then there's a lot of customers and partners that have integrated to that API to start to try and automate um, things. Uh, and, uh, and we see lots of really interesting tech. On the, there's products like Climate that's um, a hot water tank control device. Um, they can take, or we can, we're working with them and looking at how you can take the, the agile price and say, well, let's warm the hot water. Um, only the amount of hot water that you need, a percentage level, um, against the best rates, so that I've got hot water when I actually need it, rather than I might well, arbitrarily program my hot water controller from 4 p.m. because I want it hot by 8 p.m. for children's um, showers and baths and things. And you start to, the intelligence is starting to, to, to appear. We're doing it now. Right, okay. Um, <coughs> excuse me. So um, we move on now. Uh, question for, for, for Ben. Um, uh, clearly, the, the whole energy system is uh, becoming a lot more renewable now, um, uh, and that will only increase over time. Uh, 
what's driving what though? Is it the technology driving a shift to, to more renewable energy or are the renewables driving a, a shift in that technology? That's a really interesting question. Um, I, I would have, I, I think it's changed uh, in the last sort of just few years, you see solar, solar PV, which is what obviously lights with BP does, our mother company, um, mother company of labs, they're driving the, the solar rev revolution as it were, uh, evolution coming towards an evolution now. Um, solar is the cheapest form of uh, energy now, electricity. So that has changed dramatically in the last few years. Uh, one of my first solar projects was probably some 10 years ago with, with Google. We did 20 megawatt in Germany, was considered one of the largest plants at the time um, with KFW funding and so on. Today, this is the kind of stuff that, that Light Source BP does before breakfast. You know, the, yeah. the plant size is 100 megawatt and bigger and have a bigger 2 gigawatt in the management and moving towards 20 gigawatt plus uh, in a number of, of years and not decades. So. It's quite dramatic how that how that has changed, and that of course brings uh, intermittency flexibility into the grid, which then needs to be managed. Uh, and then off takers can be companies like ourselves. So with, with with labs, we have the technology that can make. I prepared one earlier that can can enable smartness in the home or turn a home smart. Uh, and as as Phil said earlier, and and others as well, charge charge batteries, charge EVs, charge charge water tanks or, or hot water in in the tanks. Um, and you'll see much more, you see grid level battery storage and so on, which is now needed in order to take excess capacity from the grid and manage that. And I think if you look back 10 years ago, it was a lot of, lot of technology looking for, for problems to solve. Um, I've been there and I've, I've had one my, my, myself and I've been banging that, that drum for a long, long time without massive scale behind it, let's face it. And in the last few years, and especially post-COVID, as we're coming out of this, this has changed dramatically. There's just no, no way back now on, on every level. Yeah. You, you mentioned intermittency uh, and also technology looking for problems to solve. Uh, and, you know, over the last two decades, uh, intermittency has, has been very much seen as a, as a problem. Are we, with all of the technology that we have getting to a situation where it can be an opportunity as well uh, and um, maybe others want to come in on this too yeah so, so so just going from my side i think we definitely are we have the technologies to make it happen today from storage to smart smart sensors to to devices and so on i think it's connecting the dots as i always say bringing that together at scale and also funding that infrastructure to make it happen because that in its nature is then going to be distributed and so in the sense of the offtake, uh, thinking of funding schemes and so on. But that's also happening now because capital markets are coming around and seeing, wow, there's a big opportunity there, let's fund it in, in orders of magnitude that weren't possible before. Sure. Others, it would, would, be, would be great to hear others on that as well in their yeah. experiences. Anyone else have any views on that? Um, I, yes, I, I think it's important uh, to realise we don't have to do everything at once, and there are, there are priorities here, the big users. So water heating, you know, the easiest of the lot, probably, um, socially and technically, um, electric vehicles, um, heating, space heating itself. We've got about, I think it's about eight times as much storage in our storage heaters in this country as we have in pump storage, for example. So there's, there is a lot out there that can be addressed relatively early on and where quite a lot of the groundwork has been done already. Um, Storage is an interesting example of one of those things which is good for the individual and good for society and good for the climate, isn't it? Because it, you know, from a selfish perspective, it lets you take advantage of agile tariffs and, and whatever, but then it also helps to stabilise the grid. So yeah. it kind of has that lovely win-win sort of quality to it. Yes, and I think getting a good dialogue going with network operators um, on these big ones seems like a priority too. Um, I, I, I was on an advisory group about developing a standard for smart home appliances. And um, it, one thing that did seem to be missing there was a good dialogue with the network operators. Um, yeah, it's important to get all the technical specifications right and so on, but there is the question of, how are the network operators going to be able to work with this? Because quite often they have quite local, you know, they're, they're addressing localized problems, 
we're working on a project at the moment, Local Energy Oxfordshire, and where we've and we've um, identified specific areas around particular substations which are going to be for facing constraint in issues for various reasons um, in the fairly near future. And that's where we really want to get the connectivity established with things like uh, supermarket freezers, um, with areas where there's a lot of storage heating, with areas where there may be a lot of electric vehicles or a lot of heat pumps soon, and get established um, a way of managing all that. And presumably um, homes will have a role to play in this as well. Once everyone's connected, you can aggregate up that, yes. mm, um, indeed. that demand and, uh, yeah. and supply, I guess, as well. Yes, and it, it is, uh, as, has, as has been said already, I mean, it's quite a challenge really um, getting the market going for that because people need to have some kind of confidence that their flexibility is going to have value in order to... Uh, bid their assets into a market, um, but the market is finding it hard to get going without having a lot of people, you know, without being able to test this out with yeah. with those assets. Yeah. So, Neil, is this an area where just coming back a, a little bit to the um, the whole storage thing? Do, do you see yourself in a way as moving from selling sort of heating products to, to energy storage products? Yeah, I think it's, I mean, storage heaters uh, in, in the UK context are very much a sort of old technology, which were designed in the 60s and 70s to, yeah. to keep large thermal plant running at night. Uh, but actually, they lend themselves very readily to this new smart world because you can decouple the supply of energy to the home from the time at which the consumer wants to have comfort. So they we have upgraded our own particular range of, of products uh, with a new brand called Quantum, which is all about that smart energy storage piece. I just wanted to, to give you an example. We were engaged in a project in Germany, which is very exciting at the moment, where we brought together uh, an energy service provider, utility player, a housing provider, uh, and an investor. And over with a 15 year horizon, uh, we have come up with a mechanism whereby we can completely replace the heating system based on thermal storage heaters in someone's home, fully funded at zero cost, zero capital cost to the consumer. And that is based on a 15 year payback model, generating sufficient return for the investment company. So that, I think it's important to recognize that these things do pay back, yeah. but you need to take a longer term view than the normal sort of consumer five to seven year bank loan type scenario. It's a 10 to 15 year payback, but it generally, it genuinely drives this decarbonization that society needs. And I think we need that bringing together all of the different players in the value chain to unlock the opportunity and this is a it's a tremendous project uh, that we've just kicked off in germany which is yeah, it does sound uh, fascinating and it highlights that it's not just the the infrastructure that ben was talking about the physical infrastructure but you need a certain amount of financial infrastructure in, in place to uh, to bring these things about as well um i'm gonna uh bring jacob in now uh, uh and ask um, how uh, have utilities had to change their business models as a result of, of the shift to renewables? Um, and um, are we seeing uh, one single winner emerge in the renewable technologies uh, or do we still need a, a, a mix of uh, technologies? No, that's, uh, that's definitely an interesting question. I think in terms of to focus on energy utilities from the kind of supply perspective and like the domestic supply perspective yeah there, there's definitely kind of material change and i think uh kind of challenge a bit of uh, kind of contestation between operating a say a business model as a incumbent energy supplier that's lean and efficient today versus being able to like focus on 
delivering against the opportunities that the that the smart home uh, energy landscape presents that we're talking about around I don't know, like delivering a, a Taiwanese tariff, delivering an electric vehicle focused product or an all-in home automation service yeah. that you know is <laughs> octopus are uh, an example that this is not a a challenge that's insurmountable or that can't be solved and there's plenty of other suppliers that are examples of it but I, I do think that kind of being able to kind of deliver on both of those areas can be a challenge for some of those parties and that it's definitely there at the moment in the market in terms of whether there's one single winner emerging on that supply side no I don't I don't think so I think there's yes there's kind of consolidation in the in the retail market but I think we're, we're a long way from being back to the kind of like 90 percent market share held by a, a kind of handful of parties that we were at uh, kind of 10 years ago so no I, I don't think that's true and I think part of that is that there's enough excitement opportunity and uncertainty around kind of what that future home landscape looks like I saw one of the kind of questions in the chat over what the role of a consumer would be in the kind of in that smart home energy world are they expected to be kind of actively engaged either kind of archetypal uh, innovative octopus customer that uh, that Phil was laying out or to be honest probably the bracket I would fall in of somebody that is enthusiastic and engaged for about a week and then uh, <laughs> forgets about it switches off and just hopes that it's kind of dealt with in the background for me and I, I don't know, I, and I would be su very surprised if there was one universal answer to that question of how people are going to behave with that. I think that yeah. kind of leaves space for a lot of different options. And you know, we we are a long way from knowing even what the what that energy utility just on the supply side, let alone kind of, to kind of build in the generation or the kind of access to generation or the network side of it looks like in that home energy landscape. I think mean, <laughs> there's potentially a, a very structurally different energy supply world and therefore like energy landscape, home energy landscape for customers in five years time compared to uh, kind of what we see today, which brings with it you know, a wealth of new pies that people could be interacting with. There's a, perhaps have seen a, a glimpse of what that looks like with something like uh, EV energy who are like a home, home energy management, EV charge optimization platform for kind of lots of things but domestic charging as an example i think the other week took domestic uh ev charging into the balancing mechanism so basically rewarding customers for providing flexibility services to the grid they're able to do that at the moment without having to actually directly interface with that household supplier and i think that kind of opening up of the concentrated supplier model that we've got today brings with it potentially a lot of change that means i wouldn't want to be naming and picking a single winner uh, for kind of that transition. No, sure. It seems that that idea of um, uh, householders not having to think too much about this, but for it all to happen automatically is uh, uh, the key to, to getting real traction, I guess. Uh, yeah, that, you I know, think... Most people aren't that engaged. Yeah, definitely. And I think for, for the energy market in particular, where there has been a very specific and tight definition of engagement meaning switching your supplier once a year <laughs> that i think that is not really compatible with what engagement looks like in that kind of future of a smart home energy world yeah. i uh, you know i could argue that i've been incredibly actively engaged in picking the home automation provider that i go with once and i've been lucky and made a successful decision there and haven't had to engage again by swapping them out uh, each year so yeah. i think it's yeah quite what that in, quite what active engagement looks like i think is definitely something that's changing in the market sure okay uh, i'm going to move on now um uh oh, actually a, a quick question for, for for dr darby about um connectivity uh, and the grid how how does connectivity um, affect the grid at the moment uh, and how do we think that that will change? Uh, sorry, how, how do you mean? Uh, well, in terms of if you've got all of these homes joined up and yeah. communicating with, um, with the network, then how does that 
help or hinder i mean I presume it helps but how, how does it change the relationship with the network and and how does that help the uh uh transmission operators and um uh, in, and distribution network operators um i guess this is a bit of an indirect answer probably but we've got to look at the connectivity taking quite a lot of different forms the communication so um you might be and 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 rethinking that because we need to think more about the local networks particularly and what's happening there so um it, it's it's about what appliances are connected up as uh, but it's and also about the people and the actors that are involved in managing that relationship between people and the grid. So that will now include aggregators. Um, it'll include um, the people who keep the network informed about new forms of demand and new forms of supply that are going on the grid. Um, Sorry, I'm not answering your. I, no, I don't feel I'm like quite talk, answering your question there. <laughs> you talked about this project in Oxfordshire. So oh right, yes. Does, does that suggest that this primarily is a local problem rather than a, a, a network-wide issue? That you know, you you, oh. you need to deal with with local uh, changes in demand. That's more important than than any kind of aggregated overall effect that there might be. I think I think often the most pressing issues facing the network are uh, and the grid the, uh, are not so much the transition uh, transmission grid level they're at network level yeah. yes that's right because there's such a lot a more distributed supply on now and because the patterns of demand are changing quite rapidly yeah. so um, it's very important to be building up experience in that area because it's uh, uh, because it's going to be increasingly important. Yeah, and over presumably the next decade or so. Yeah, lessons learned from projects yeah. such as the, the Oxfordshire one will will provide yeah. real um, uh, useful information for for other areas. Uh, yes, other, uh, I, I think it, it's hard to overstress the importance of doing demonstration projects. Yeah. I mean, they take a lot of courage. You know, they're hard work. They involve lots and lots of interactions and complications and so on, but they're just so valuable. Yeah. Because, and if you look at the research literature, I mean, it's just staggering the number of papers there are out there that, that are based on, you know, desk work and models compared yeah. with the amount of findings that we actually have from testing out these technologies in real life conditions. And you learn such a, a lot from that. Yeah. Thank you very much. Um, so we're going to move on now. Uh, and look at the idea of of silos. Um, uh, Pilgrim, can you just explain a little bit about what that means and, and how that that translates into into the the idea of a smart home? Sure. Um, yeah, I'm really enjoying this discussion. It's fascinating to have so many insights from different perspectives. Um, so I suppose, yeah, the idea of silos really is. I've been involved in innovation in a number of different markets, and you, you tend to notice that early on in a market, the, the early players to the market have to do everything themselves because there's no one else to work with. Um, and, and, and the net result of that is often that things end up being quite siloed. Um, and, uh, you know, over time, that's not the best solution for, for everyone. And, and then and what you want is the silos to join up into to an ecosystem. So I think um, just to kind of riff on some of the things that the people have been talking about um, at my previous company, Alert Me, where we built what became Hive from British Gas. So one of the first smart home platforms in the UK, um, we, um, uh, you know, we realized that there were really three steps. And I think Neil already touched on this so the first thing is you can give people information about what's going on with the energy in their home well that's that's good and that might be actionable but then you also need to give them control so they can change that number and make it better but if you stop there then you've left them in the loop you've left them with the management overhead um, which they may not have the um, the interest or the time or the knowledge to 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 do so you have to take go to the third step which is around sort of automation um, 
to, to sort of close close the loop. And that um, that can give sort of individual users uh, reliability, but also as various people have said, it, it gives the wider grid potentially sort of resilience and, and uh, adaptivity. Um, so if you think about the kind of home of, of an early adopter today, and I think that's partly what we're talking about here is moving from the early adopters to the mainstream. Yeah. But if you look at an early adopter's home today, you know, when, when should you charge your car? When should you heat your hot water? You know, the answer is dependent on multiple inputs. I mean, sure, if you've got an agile tariff, that's an important one, but also is the sun shining on your PV? You know, that's, that's another input. Um, uh, as Neil said, you know, because heating is so laggy, you, you probably need to predict things as well. Uh, maybe predict energy prices, predict the weather, that kind of stuff, that's another source of input. So, so we've got lots of sources of input, lots of signals, if you like, that are coming on stream. Um, and we've got an increasing number of things that we can control to, to take action. Um, and so I think this sort of idea of joining up the silos is going to be trying to put those things together. Um, you know, if, if, if you've got a washing machine or a tumble dryer or something in your home, some conventional thing that we're all familiar with, you know, when should it run? Uh, how, how should it know when to run? Um, that's just quite a simple yeah. question. But, uh, you know, you only have to, to walk around your house after a power cut uh, yeah. and, and look at all the flashing 12s to sort yeah. of see that there are a lot of devices that have intelligence in them, but local yeah. intelligence isn't very intelligent. Uh, you have to start joining things up um, for the intelligence to actually be useful. And I think, um, you know, as we've already touched on, that that joining up will start to happen in the home, within the home, um, yeah. but it also between the home and the rest of the world, generation and forecasting and so on. Um, something we used to talk about um, at Alert Me was the battle of the gateways. There's quite an interesting kind of dynamic going on, I think, about who owns the customer. Uh, that was quite helpful for us at Alert Me when, um, as Ben will remember, when Google came into the, the market with Nest, um, uh, that was extremely helpful to us because our biggest customer, British Gas, looked at that and saw a massive threat that Google would interpose itself um, as, as the main owner of the relationship, the, the main controller of energy in the home and relegate utilities to a very minor bit part. And I think, you know, the discussion um, that Jacob raised about kind of um, relationships with different vendors. You know, we may have multiple relationships with multiple vendors around all these services. Um, and I think there's a, there's an interesting sort of battle of the gateways shaping up again uh, around who who will be the primary relationship that that sort of controls all the others in the eyes of the consumer. Um, just one one sort of final thought. Um, uh, Sarah, Sarah was talking about the uh, various Oxford experiments, and uh, we were involved in in one in um, 2015 uh, in Oxford with Moixa, the battery storage people. They've got a really nice uh, social housing estate there with a couple of hundred houses which have PV and battery storage. So, so you know, quite an early experiment, but at, at a good scale. And what we were looking at with them was um, sharing energy locally within the housing estate. Um, and the, the really interesting insight from that, which did not was not obvious to me until we did it, was that um, with a lot of energy interventions, you're actually trying to get everyone to do the same thing. So like with energy efficiency, you want everyone to do the same thing. You want everyone to insulate their homes. You, know? you want everyone to use electricity you know, you know, off peak or whatever. But actually what we discovered um, uh, with this idea of sharing energy locally within the housing estate is actually you want diversity. You want people that are doing things that other people aren't doing. So if you've got yeah. maybe a retired elderly couple cooking their lunch at, at noon, you also want to have some houses where everyone's out to work uh, and the sun's shining on their panels and they're producing net energy to help power th that cooker. And so, you know, I, I suppose the insight there for me was that a healthy ecosystem has a lot of diversity uh, within it and, and that's true not just at a housing association level but but you know um the, the whole ecosystem i think um of, of the country so um yeah so just some thoughts there really about about how these these individual silos of of um connected devices the the smart meters the evs and so on, so on uh, are going to start to to join up well pilgrim it's oh ben's trying to get in there as well yeah so i just uh <clears throat> So is the timing okay? Yeah, go for it. Pilgrim mentioned Google Icon. <laughs> I couldn't couldn't resist. Uh, and Pilgrim, this is interesting because you and I we first met some 15 years ago when you were a launch customer of, of Google, Google Power Meter at mm. the time, right? And that was something where you said that's a good idea, probably 10 years ahead of its time. 
uh, and they're still not 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 getting it right. Nest, you know, I have a few million thermostats now out in the market. I have one, it's Nest or Hive now, but they're not exactly, you know, breaking the the the, the mold here and and taking over. And I think people continue to ask me, "Aren't you scared of Google?" I'm like, not not really, not yet, because. Uh, energy is just too complicated. There's too many gateways. There's too. There's not one standard to rule them all. We all know that. Uh, once it's all going to be HTTP based, it's going to be a different story. But right now, not not yet. Not for the next few years. Um, I've been thinking. So sorry, this is uh, stacked up in my head. So I wanted to just address a couple of points that were make made. And one of the one of the questions on Q and A. So so to um, to to Neil's point earlier, long term. And I just sent sent Neil a private message on on Zoom here point taken and, and that makes a lot of sense. We've been struggling to make our business model work with, with labs with the home energy management system on a two, two, three year payback. You know, you just about have payback. It doesn't really work at that level, still costs a few hundred bucks. But if you look at it in a 10 year horizon together with battery and solar and this thing, it, it can really work. And there's a lot of, uh, there's a good business model in, in this for, for everybody involved, starting with the homeowner savings uh, to, the, to, the, to the utility, to the grid operator and so on. And that's what we're pursuing now. Um, to Jacob's point and the question here by Phil Claridge, will people look at it for more than a week or three months? The answer is no, uh, and they never have. And that was the problem 10 years ago with smart meter rollout with the consumer devices, with power meter 15, 15 years ago. It just doesn't work at that level. You need something that, that, that is able to, to connect those dots and to do it automatically. Also because there's just so much information, it's impossible for a single human to monitor this and to optimize this, even if they checked it, every half hour because it is now operating at minute level, at second level, you know, sun shining, not shining, grid events and so on. So you need a device or a, a connection or a brain to do this in, in an automated fashion. And I think a smart meter helps, but but you need to really have that technology in the in the home. Um, and I think it's really coming together and, and it's starting now, just the five, six of us here on the panel can 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 really can really make that work as well. Mm. So, Phil, I know you've got something to say, but I, I... I want to bring in Neil first because I, yeah. I think um, Pilgrim talked about these various sort of levels that this works on. So um, at the, the the sort of home level and, and with the you know your products, does this idea of, of silos is that useful to you, Neil, as as a company, and does it help you to sort of plot a route forward for the future? Uh, you're on mute, uh, by the way. Beg your pardon, sorry about that. We've been involved in, in numerous different demonstrator projects over the years. Sarah will be smiling at this, but we, you know, we we have engaged to try to deal with the silo issue with players from lots of different sectors. And our project in Germany that I mentioned earlier is probably a good example of that. I think my point is slightly different, which is that we need to remember this is all about electrification in this conversation and at a macro scale, what the UK is doing is pumping a huge investment into offshore wind generation. I think the, the latest number is a 40 gigawatt of wind capacity offshore yeah. uh, is the vision at the moment on a, on a grid which currently consumes about that at a maximum. So the big question is how do you use 40 gigawatts of intermittent wind generation on a 40 gigawatt grid? And we're talking here about small scale individual homes. Uh, and the, 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 you know, this, the order of magnitude of difference between the two is vast. So the only way you're going to be able to make this system work in the future, if you have a, a coordinated collective approach to it and the demand side management uh, future model, I think will be all about trying to cope with this new generation situation we face. And light source is the same. Light source is, you know, massive assets under control in terms of solar generation as well. Uh, so I, I, what we're seeing in terms of the silo debate is how you join up, you know, from massive generation capability at one end down to the individual home at the other uh, in, a, in a combined way. And the grid always has to balance. So one my, my final point before I, I leave it is that the, there's a, a market for system services in the UK, which is how basically how National Grid keeps the 50 hertz frequency in balance. And that's about managing supply and demand at all times. And in the past, that's always done by having 
fossil fuel generators idling in the background and ready to switch on and switch off on demand. In future, it's going to be all about aggregated demand doing the same thing and keeping the, the frequency at 50 hertz. And that'll be, you know, you can't allow consumers control over that. You actually have to take that to some extent away from them. And the siloed approach won't work. Otherwise, the grid will collapse. So, you know, these are big, big issues for the country. And uh, we as appliance manufacturers simply watch and learn and try and make sure the technology that we are developing is going to be relevant to that future world. Uh, and so, Phil, is is that where a company like Octopus comes in? Do you have a role to play uh, you know, with the, the mm. products you offer and, and how you tailor them? So do you have to, to a certain extent, you know, you're offering them to the consumer, but do you have to have an eye on the networks as well uh, yep. to, to provide, uh, you know, and is that actually something you can monetize or, or is it um, yes. oh, yep. it's a public um, good? I was I was going to come back on uh, Pilgrim's point about diversity, but I can answer that question as well. So I mean, one of our businesses is, is Upside, which is the flexibility um, market platform. Right. So that is working with uh, DNOs and National Grid, where there is flexibility markets, whether that's uh, grid frequency response. And you'll see um, Devrim, um, the CEO of Upside, he, he tweets every now and then, and some of his team when we balance um, frequency uh, with um, large scale battery deployments and things that they're managing. Um, just going on to the diversity point as well, which kind of affects that as well. Um, with our Go tariff, um, the Go tariff has a 5p rate between half midnight and half four in, in the morning and is aimed at uh, electric vehicle charges. And as, as Pilgrim was saying with that example of a portfolio of properties, if they're all doing the same thing at the same time, you create a different issue. Uh, and that's what happens is you get a whole load of EV charges all light up at half past midnight. So we, we ran a trial over the last year with um, UKPN, it's called Shift, and we created a tariff called Go Faster. And under that, we offer customers, well, do you want um, a half eight or a half nine or a half 10 through to half three start? And do you want a three, four or five hour version with a slightly different price? So um, a half a pence below and above the old go rate. But the twist in the, in the tariff was that we said, apply for which start time you want and the duration you want, but actually you may not get it. And we may have to give you one an hour earlier or an hour later. Um, depending on availability. And we made it a kind of an, a, an availability sort of sort of tariff. Um, and we also advise customers, we may shuffle the deck and allocate you a different tariff. And, and I ran the algorithm and shuffled them from time to time. We let customers um, agree that they were gonna change them to another tariff, but still 80, 90% actually did agree and, and had no issue. They understood what we were trying to achieve with that sort of in, intelligent type of tariff that we're trying to smooth out the load. And the, there's a, if you do a search for the um, UKPN shift um, report, um, other energy suppliers and other technologies took part in that uh, program as well last year. And there's a really interesting write up and analysis as to the outcomes of that. And it just kind of sets the direction that you can say, well, customers are open to responding um, with clever tariffs and intelligence and how devices might be connected, you know, because we have an API of all the tariffs and there are lots of devices and systems that are now attached to that which um, there's still a long way to go. And there's some questions here about the fragmentation of uh, the connectivity of the devices. And there's no standard APIs and the rest of it, but there's plenty of innovation going on there and it will, it will come. Um, I'd rather not the government through, let's say, smart meters start trying to mandate that all EV charges are smart and go through the DCC smart meter infrastructure. You know, there's, there's plans and ideas to do that, but let the market, let the innovators um, create these it's still really really early in this space at the moment yeah uh, and uh jacob can i bring you in now um what, what does this mean for for the average customer and uh how how they interact with uh with their their power bill i suppose they you know uh, because at the moment you you use your energy, you get a bill, you pay it. Uh, is is that going to change or are customers going to have to uh, become a bit more proactive? Uh, will they have that choice, but you know, not have to, or, or will it look completely different? Yeah, um, well, in terms of will it have to fundamentally change, given the 
pace of change perhaps that we've seen historically in the in the energy market i'd be reluctant to say that in a couple of years everybody's uh, like energy experience is going to be radically different but and i think i think that does definitely touch on like a really interesting point around do you have to engage and say be settled on or be build on that half hourly price basis for this transition to be like successful or for for that to be participating in it i I would hope not. Um, I think, and I'd be surprised if there isn't an enduring role for uh, like translating that half hourly vari- half hourly variability in price into still a flat rate fixed price tariff for people to be on if they if they want. I think there's a lot of value for that as a yeah. potential household customer in being on uh, a, a predictable tariff, but one that you're kind of used to as well. Uh, does that mean that 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 household or that person can't be involved in some of the like smart interest in flex opportunities and stuff that we've talked about no i don't think so like i think there's nothing to say that that same property that's on a flat rate tariff for its house can't also then have the energy management service provider taking the demand or the kind of capacity out of its um, electrified heating system or its EB into balancing services, providing a reward into that customer for doing so, um, but, and not, and I don't say, keeping a greater share of that themselves in exchange for translating it into something that's flat and stable for, for kind of them to be on. I think we're, I was just looking at an answer to one of the question in the chat as well, but uh, Potentially, you know, we're moving toward where you can see su- maybe supply, but certainly like uh, flexibility management being segmented at the like larger device level. So say having like separate metering for your EV charging or for your um, heat and demand and being able to do something interesting with those loads separate to the um, like rest of that household. I mean, that's obviously important for providing customer choice and bringing people along in that transition. But I mean, part of it definitely comes into the kind of equity side as well of <laughs> what it means to be able to access the assets that do that. And I think to my mind, that's where some of the uh, like zero upfront cost products become particularly interesting um, is in kind of broadening out access to those, to something that generally has carried a pretty high like capital cost to, to come and participate in it. Yeah. Okay. Uh, we're we're coming to the end of our time, um, so I might just ask a wrap up question to uh, to everyone. We, we, you know, we've talked a lot about um, the technologies uh, and the opportunities that that they create. What what are the key um, challenges and barriers that that we we need to overcome? Uh, and and are there any sort of obvious solutions to that? Uh, sorry, I'll start with Pilgrim. And, uh... Well, I suppose I'll answer that with a negative answer in terms of what we shouldn't do. I mean, I think something we learned from the smart meter um, uh, process is that sort of involving government in the process of rolling out technical standards makes it very, very slow. <laughs> um, and, and so I think, you know, I'm not a sort of diehard libertarian, but I think what we're starting to see is an explosion of, of innovation and creativity in the market responding to all the all the sort of market signals. And I think that's incredibly exciting. Um, and, and, and you know, we obviously need the emergence of technical standards and other kinds of standards to, to allow everyone to join up the silos. But I think that's probably best done by sort of multi-part, um, uh, you know, commercial entities, perhaps supervised by government rather than government trying to come in and mandate how everything happens. I think we're now into the era of, of the internet uh, in terms of how all this stuff's joining up. And that's and that's very exciting. And that tends to happen sort of bottom up, not top down. Yeah. Uh, Phil? Same point. Let the innovators innovate. Uh, don't, don't dictate, you know, um, there's, there are so many really interesting businesses creating all sorts of really interesting hardware technology. Everything is kind of internet based um, and, and APIs are not rocket science to, to connect and make interesting things happen with. Cool. Um, Neil? Well, just to put the, the kinder view on the table, the, 
I've been reading with interest what's happened with the EV charging infrastructure around the country in recent weeks, and it's a bit of a shambles. You know, we have multiple different uh, connections. The uh, the sort of service station approach to charging is very hit or miss. Uh, YouTube is full of videos of frustrated people unable to charge their vehicles because the plug doesn't fit in the socket. Tesla have done it really well, but you need to buy a Tesla to take advantage of that. So we're, we're concerned that in the heating and home energy space, without some sort of standardization of approach, we could end up with a mess. Right, yeah. Uh, that seems like a, an important point uh, right the way up and down the system, I, I guess. Um, uh, ben, do you have any uh, thoughts on this? Yeah, um, I, I would second all that was said before me, but I'll take a slightly a different perspective here again. And uh, I'm an aerospace engineer, so I don't know much about finance, but I've struggled with that uh, the last 20 years in solving this problem, and I think it's being solved now. So I would say bankability in, in one word. Uh, 20 years ago, so solar PV large scale wasn't bankable. It was all residential back in old Germany. Then 10 megawatt wasn't bankable, then 100 wasn't bankable. It all became bankable very quickly, different inverters, different suppliers. Talk about grid level storage. We were sharing offices with, with Pivot Power a few years ago at uh, you know, 10 megawatt grid level, 50 megawatt that wasn't bankable. And now it's now it's you know people throwing money after that. And you'll see that at the home level as well. And I think there's gonna be a lot of money coming into the market financing the solutions that we talked about, Neil. And, and the rest of the panel, and that's going to really make make a change and really start scaling up. Um, Jacob, any thoughts? Um, no, I think probably try and tie two of them together, but yeah, don't leave. I think the transition to smarter energy management would have not been successful if we've left half the people behind along the way. Um, there is definitely a role for uh, market regulation in doing that but I, I agree that if equally I think if the transition to a smart home energy looks like a SMET standard for everything then we've probably also failed along the way. Yeah okay uh, and Sarah the, the final word to you. Oh I say <laughs> uh, I think I'd go for trust building and keeping it real. Um, let's keep demonstrating these technologies, testing them out in real life conditions, getting the word out getting a national conversation going around it, going on around it, getting local conversations going on around it. And people will learn to trust automation when they see that it works for their neighbors, for their friends. Um, and, and let's stay focused too on, on the most important sort of end uses where, where smart home energy is, is going to count the most for individuals, but also for the network and, and socially. Yeah. Uh, and do you think um, there will be a time when we can say all homes are smart or is this something, you know, that we will always be uh, rolling towards and, uh, and then it will keep evol evolving? Uh, well, I mean, you could say pretty much every, every home now has a smartphone in it, for example. I mean, we... Yeah we have this technology it's gradually percolating into our lives and now we're at the stage of learning how to use it intelligently ourselves um, yeah indeed so, yeah it'll carry on yeah well uh it's a fascinating discussion uh thank you all for your time uh and um uh just some some really interesting food for thought there uh, i hope everyone enjoyed it uh so i just Remains for me to say thank you to, to Sarah, Jacob, Phil, Pilgrim, uh, Ben, uh, and uh, I've lost my other screen, uh, and Neil. Uh, and um, thank you all for, for listening. Thanks so much, uh, Mike. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, Bye -bye. Thanks very thank much. You. Bye. <laughs>